I'm Alec Pecky, and I'm going to perform introductions of our panelists today. We're um, going to be talking about what's a weapon, um, choosing ways to, to murder beyond a gun, knife, poison, um, what are the tools of murder. Um, so Tori Eldridge is the Honolulu-born author of The Ninja's Blade and uh, the, the first book in the Lily Wong series, The Ninja Daughter, nominated for Anthony Lefty McCavity Awards for Best First Novel and named one of the best mystery books of the year by the South Florida Sun Sentinel. Tori has short stories published in several anthologies, a narrative poem in the inaugural reboot of Weird Tales magazine, <laughs> and a screenplay that earned a semifinalist spot for the Academy Nicole Fellowship. Tori holds a fifth degree black belt in, okay, I'm gonna get this word wrong, Toshin Du Nijitsu. Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> and has traveled the U.S. teaching ninja arts and women's self-protection. Um, you can reach her at ToriEldridge.com. Barb Goffman specializes in writing short stories. She's been a finalist 30 times for U.S. Mystery Short Story Awards and has won the Agatha McCavity and Silver Fashion. Is that how you say it? Sure, why not? <laughs> um, this weekend, she's up for a McCavity Award for Best Short Story um, and the Anthony Award in about two hours uh, for the Best Anthology. Her stories have appeared in many venues, including Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, and Black Cat Mystery Magazine. Barb also works as a freelance editor, um, focusing on cozy and traditional mysteries. Tessa Wagert. I got that right, right? You did, that's perfect. <laughs> is the author of the Shana Merchant series of mysteries beginning with Death in the Family. Prior to writing fiction, Tessa was a freelance journalist for almost 20 years during which time her work appeared in such publications as Forbes, the, Hun uh, the Huffington Post, Adweek, and The Economist. Tessa grew up in Quebec near the border of Vermont and now lives with her family in coastal Connecticut where she writes while studying martial arts and dance. Linda Joffrey Hall is the author of The Big Bang and three books in the Mrs. Frugalicious Mystery Ser Series, Eternally 21, Black Thursday, and Sweetheart Deal. Linda's recent short story, Black Cow, appeared in Down and Out, Steely Dan inspired anthology. Down and Out books, sorry. <clears throat> Linda also comprises one half of the win of the writing team, Linda K Kerr, with here, author here. Kerr Graf. Did I get that wrong? Here. 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 Oh. Yeah. They should have had someone who's better at pronouncing names. Um, with author... Here. Okay. Here. There you go. <laughs> Rhymes with beer. That's easy. Yeah, that will help. Keep your draft. The latest novel, The Three Mrs. Rights, is now available in all formats. I'm Malik Pecky, the California author of 15 novels and two series. Uh, the Damian Green series features a Mac MacGyver-type inventor who lives alone on an island in San Francisco Bay and assists a retired San Francisco or San Jose Police Department detective in solving cold cases. The other series features Dr. Jill Quint, who is a part-time PI, part vintner, and a forensic pathologist. Book 11 of this series, titled Forensic Murder, features a crime scene tech that goes on a killing spree in Australia and New Zealand. It will be released November 2nd. So those are our introductions. Um, why don't we start with... Um, the question of the hour, what is the most original method of killing that you've read about or used in a mystery? Um, Barb, as the uh, writer of so many short stories, I'll, I'll toss this one to you first. Um, if we're gonna talk about ones that I've used, I, I think the most original one was an alligator. I had a story in the Bauschikan, Florida, the St. Pete anthology a couple of years ago, however many years ago it was, 
um, where a man wanted to kill his wife. So he tried to train an alligator who lived in the pond, not pond, waterway behind their house to um, eat missing pot roast from their house with the goal that eventually he was going to push his wife down and try to get the alligator to eat her. Did he succeed? He did not. <laughs> oh, my God. Tessa? Um, well, I will say I just finished reading a book that uh, I will not name because I don't want to spoil it for everyone who hasn't read it. But the, um, the killer actually used a, a natural hazard on a ski hill, a cliff face um, to commit a murder. So that was one of the more original ones that I had seen. I mean, definitely you'll you'll see people using, you know, sticks or rocks or other objects found in nature to commit a crime. But this was very clever, I thought, to kind of steer the victim toward the cliff that the 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 antagonist knew they could not survive. So that was a good one, I thought. <clears throat> Tori. Oh boy, I knew you were gonna come to me. Hmm. Um yeah, okay. So I'm gonna cop out a little bit and use one that I uh used in a short story. And it ended up it was um in a horror anthology actually, and it used a Brazilian, uh not Brazilian, Balinese occult. And so I had a witch doctor using these monkeys that came in and took over this guy and they snuck in and yeah, it was, it was pretty horrific actually, but yeah, that was odd. So. Wow. Monkeys, alligators and monkeys. Linda. <laughs> well, so when you're talking murder, it matters what the situation is. And the idea would be theoretically to get away with the murder. So, um, I have been lucky enough to write stuff that isn't necessarily always involved murder, but when I do, um, I like to um, make it work with what I'm doing. So when I was writing the Mrs. Frugalicious mystery series, I had to come up with creative ways to kill people off. And so I think the one, and, and you've kind of men mentioned it, Alec, in your note to me, I um, pushed a pallet of toasters um, onto someone in a big box store. So I think that was the best death that, um, that I've accomplished in my fiction world. I don't want to talk about my real world. <laughs> nice one. I love it. Death by toaster. <laughs> Death by pellet of toasters, not just a toaster. And they were on sale, which was, you know. Just <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> and if I were to think, um, you know, part, I, part of the enjoyment of writing mysteries is sometimes trying to think of something original, some original way to kill people. And um, in my latest book, uh, which is set down under, there's so many deadly creatures that I just had like this full menu of um, animals that I could use to um, knock some people off. So um, setting helps the warehouse or um, whatever, um, give us writers creative ways to, to kill people. Um, What motivated um, you to become a writer, Tori? Um, you, we were talking a little bit before the panel started that um, you switched from full-time ninja crisscrossing the U.S. to writing. Um, what inspired you to to make that switch? Actually, I've been a little more eclectic than that. My career <laughs> path began as an actress, singer, dancer on Broadway, television, and film. So like when I was 20 or, you know, something like that, I, I guess I was like on Broadway with Michael York and toured with Anthony Quinn and was in the first national of cats and then came out West and was on the, the love boat and as a series regular and, and some movies and things. And then my husband switched from real estate to uh, film and television producing. So we got all of these screenplays 
So I started reading a lot of screenplays. Well, I had always been an avid reader and writing was always a strength of mine in school. My husband was like, you should try your hand at this. So the first uh, screenplay that I actually completed that was, you know, any good, it was the one that ended up earning that semi-finalist spot at the Nicole Fellowship. And everybody read it and said, oh, you should be writing novels. And so I did. And, uh, and I really enjoyed it. But at that time, I had two young sons. They're grown up now. I'm expecting my first grandchild. Um, but at that time, they were very young. And I had just put one of them into karate and had this brilliant idea that I wanted to get in there as well. And so in my life, I have always been all in completely immersive. And I knew that if I wanted to pursue a career in writing, I would have to do that again. And at that time, I wasn't willing to do that. And so it wasn't for another 13 years that that pull to keep, you know, to come back to fiction just finally became unbearable. And at that point, I had earned the, you know, I was already a fifth degree black belt. I had done pretty much what I wanted to do with martial arts. And I went, now's the time. This is going to be the new um, career for the second half century of my life. And so I made a complete switch and timed it right around my 50th birthday. Wow. Um, I see some questions coming through on the chat and I'll, I'll get to the, I'm writing them down and I'll get to them once we, um, a few more of us answer this question. Um, Barb, with all the awards you've gotten writing short stories, it seems like you've been out writing a while. Um, how did you get into writing? I was an attorney and I desperately needed a creative outlet. <laughs> Writing briefs is just really, I, I, I frankly, I, I think that lawyers could write differently. I think they could do what they need to do and still make it interesting, but the people I worked for didn't believe in that. So um, I started taking writing workshops um, for writing mystery and I got 11 chapters into one novel when I got stuck because I have to write linearly and I needed to talk to someone and an expert wasn't available for a while. So then I started writing another one and then I started writing short stories and I fell in love with them. So here I am. And Linda, you followed an interesting path um, in doing some novels by yourself and then partnering with someone else to write additional novels. Maybe you can comment on, on that career path as well. Well, I mean, I still theoretically write novels on my own, but but I've been lucky enough in the last four or five years to have contracts that have been, you know, one after another. We had three books with um, with Amazon Publishing, with like Union and, and another one. But what happened was, uh, and I anyone who knows us knows the story really well, that I'd written a few novels. I'd written the Mrs. Fergalicious um, mystery series, and I had this idea that I wanted to write a book about swingers. And because I think it's, I'm not a swinger. And I always say that at all these, and if you are, God bless you, but it's not my, my bag. I'm too much of a germ phobe. But, um, but I wanted to write a book about swingers and I tended to write sort of dark comedic stuff. And I honestly didn't think of it as that funny of a, of a topic. And it was rolling around in my head for a few years. And I was at VoucherCon in St. Louis and um, I was in the book room. I think it was the book room. Kier, my writing partner's watching. I always thought it was the bar, but um, I'd met Kier a few years earlier at uh, Love is Murder in Chicago seemed like a nice fella. And um, we were talking to an agent named Amy Moore Benson, who's now a good friend of ours. And I said, she's like, what are you two working on? And I said, you know, I want to write this book about swingers, but I, I can't figure out how to do it. I want it to be, you know, I, I usually write funny and I don't think it's funny. And then Kier says, you know, I've been thinking about and sort of researching writing a book about swingers too, but I think it should be funny. <laughs> and I looked at him and he looked at me and, and someone later said, oh, what a pickup line that is, which it wasn't. Um, and um, Amy said, you guys ought to write it together. And we both, uh, the way I described it, is looked at each other like birds, you know, like, Could, can you can you even do that? And we, we actually spent the next almost year um, talking on the phone, reading each other's work, thinking about, and then plotting. It took us almost you know seven or eight months to plot this novel, which we ended up writing together. and. The rest is history. It went so well. Um, it took quite a while to sell, even though um, our agent, who we now share, um, thought it was going to sell right right away, but it didn't. And um, when it did, it ended up, 
you know, now we've written a mystery together. We've written a, a suspense novel that's, I think it's domestic suspense. It's out right now. And uh, we're about to embark on a new project. So he writes middle grade children's books at the same time. Um, most of our stuff doesn't have that, that kind of um, subject matter. Um, and I just haven't because it's been, you know, enough to write this and I do freelance freelance uh, ghostwriting stuff. So I'm, I'm busy enough not to have a Linda Joffe Hall book. Hopefully I will one of these days. Wow. So. And Tessa, like, I really admire your journalism background because I always figured that for journalists, turning to novel writing is like brushing your teeth. It's the easiest thing after you've been writing in a professional career. Did you find that so? I did to some extent. Um, like Barb, I was looking for more of a creative outlet. A lot of the work that I did um, was branded content. So I would work closely with brands like IBM and write, you know, articles for them on their behalf that would appear maybe on Business Insider's website or the, that kind of thing. So, you know, that was interesting in one sense, but it didn't really fulfill that creative need that I was feeling. So when my um, kids were something like nine months old and two years old, I decided that I was going to try to write a novel. And I did think that it would be easy in a sense because I had the, you know, the experience researching for one thing. And I had worked with editors a lot and I wasn't, I don't think very precious with my words. I mean, I was fine with having someone come in and slash and burn what I had done if it was going to make things better. I was fine with cutting entire chapters. In fact, that's kind of become my process and it's not very quick, but it is somewhat effective. I end up just writing, you know, chapters and chapters that just to see if something will work and I need to actually visualize it before I can decide if it's something I wanna put into the final book. And then, you know, I'll sometimes just scrap it all but then if I do decide to keep it, I feel really much more confident in my decision because I've had a chance to try out other options. So in that sense, I think it has been somewhat easier. Death in the Family is my debut novel and it just came out in February and I have the sequel coming out already in December. So that was a bit fast and unexpected to some extent that that all, you know, after having done this for about 10 years um, before Death in the Family sold, um, yeah, it's all moving very quickly now. And I still am working as a journalist on the side too, on a freelance yeah. basis. So it's been busy, but fun and exciting. And I'm, I'm happy to, you know, straddle both of those, both of those industries. Wow. I, I can't imagine my spare time activity being an extension of my day job, write all day, then go home and write some more. But I, I guess, you know, Anybody who upsets you in your day job, you can kill off at, at night. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You do need some blue light glasses with the amount of time, you know, if you're spending <laughs> that yeah. many hours on a screen. So there are some drawbacks, I think, to this kind of life, but I do enjoy it. Um, Linda, your partner uh, said that you guys met in the book room, I think, in the, it says That's in the what I'm, I'm now remembering, I'm being told. <laughs> I tell this story so often, but there was a conversation afterwards in the bar that was more, you know, we talked about it in the book room and then we went to the bar and if there was a big group of people and the conversation continued and we laughed about it for many, many hours because it seemed so absurd. And now, you know, four books later, almost starting our fourth book. So it, it was absurd. So we've, um, by the way, there, there's been a couple of good jokes in the chat. Um, Someone said that the, the drop of the pallet of toasters could be called discount death since the toasters were on sale. I thought that was pretty funny. Black Thursday. Um, Black <laughs> Thursday. Happened, the whole thing, it happens at a big box store. So, you know, got to think about where you're killing people and why you're killing people. And it, if you're at the big box store on, on, uh, on Black Friday, it seems like the best way to go. Yeah. Certainly the right way to do it, day to do it. Exactly. <laughs> so someone um, in the audience asked about um, locked room mysteries and how people kill in locked room mysteries and um, if any of us on the panel had an opinion of what's been overused in a locked room mystery. So 
I'll throw that out to anyone who wants to answer that question. I guess I'll answer it because my because death in the family is I I would think considered a, a locked room mystery. Um, I don't use this technique, but if you're talking about methods of murder that are maybe somewhat overdone, um, although it is certainly possible to put a more contemporary twist on them, I would say poison would be pretty high on the list because if you're in that kind of situation, with a lot of people around and you have to be quite stealthy with your approach to knocking someone off, poison is a pretty, you know, pretty high on the list as far as options go. Um, and that was something obviously that Agatha Christie used quite a lot of cyanide in her books. So that that's the only one that really comes to mind for me. I always like it when they, you know, manage to, you know, prick the skin and just like put in a little bit of, you know, some bizarre, you know, poison in there, you know, like the umbrella thing with uh, the ricin or the polonium or, you know, just something that seems very ninja-y to me to be able to use some kind of little dart that's, uh, you know, that's laced with something. But it'd be so much more fun than just giving it to them to eat. <laughs> um. Our, our friend from Melbourne suggested uh, gassing a room with nitrogen. And I actually did that in one of my books. I can't remember which one. Because um, you just go to sleep and because you're not getting enough oxygen, you die. Um, and it's fairly invisible, uh, the nitrogen. Um, and I believe they use that for suicide in, in some countries if you can get your hands on it. Um, carbon, and, carbon monoxide can do the same thing. I use that yeah. in one of the stories. Um, Trouble with ooh. carbon monoxide is you turn pink. And so uh, it, it's real easy for the cops to figure out um, that you're, you're dead because you're bright pink. Um, but if you think that you can get away with it, that they don't know, won't know it's you. Right. You just want to. So it doesn't it, matter. Yeah. Everyone's killed some uh, with diet pills. If you're going to be, you know, oh. using poison, and she was dieting a lot, and I liked that because it made me feel good <laughs> about food and eating. And so, um, I, I, the person who died was accidental, but it was in a, a kind of a locked room scenario. But I, if you're going to poison someone, it needs to be once again creative, because yeah. it is a typical way of killing someone in a, you know, there's guns, there's knives, there's poison. Well, what I like about what you did was that you tied it into the character. I kind of think you have to, you know, I mean, that's that then that starts to operate on, you know, other layered, you know, levels, which I think then can take something that's mundane and make it, you know, interesting and in some ways even profound, depending on, you know, the connection to the character or the plot. So, well, I just feel like especially with um, people who read mysteries a lot, they've read a whole lot of different deaths. Right. And so how are you going to make it different and interesting and work with the character and work with the situation so that a reader who could be jaded. I mean, I, I know people who read a mystery a day. So, I, I mean, I, I think of the wonderful Drew Ann Love who does that pretty much every day, reads a book if you know her. Um, so I, I feel like I'm looking at that reader and like, can I give you a little something that you, that isn't exactly what you've seen or that you've seen a million times before in a different way. So. But if, if I could expand on that, I, I think what's, what we used to see in Golden Age Mysteries was authors trying to find clever ways to kill someone, and it was all about the puzzle. And, and those are great, but a lot of readers today are really looking for stories that, that, that really speak to them psychologically. So it, to me, it's less about finding a clever way to kill someone than finding the right way to kill someone that works with the character and the situation. So it could be a knife, and it could be a gun, and it could be poison. Right. But it also could be an alligator. It all depends on what fits into the scenario that you've got. I love that you brought that up because, um, so the, the Lily Wong series, it's not a typical mystery. Uh, it isn't a murder mystery. There isn't anything, you know, that have, people do die. <laughs> Um, and then she's responsible for some of those deaths. Uh, so there is that. But, you know, the, the thing about that that I was striving for was to make it fresh in that I was taking something that was obviously a complex mystery, but was decidedly kind of in the action thriller realm. But I wanted to do a deep dive into relationships and family and culture because Lily Wong is half 
uh, Hong Kong Chinese and half North Dakota Norwegian. That's her father. And so it, it, those things are not things that you usually see in a mystery thriller, unless it's what historical fiction or something. You usually, if you want to really get a cultural dive and, and really look at relationships and, you know, family development and dynamics, you're going to go to the, you know, the literary fiction department or historical fiction. But I wanted it all mixed up with a complex mystery and a fast paced action thriller. So, you know, from my point of view, that was kind of like my solution to, I mean, I didn't set out to write a mystery. I didn't set out to, you know, break, you know, the, the, the mold of that. It's just what kind of came out. Um, someone suggested a poisonous spider and I did use that in my upcoming book. There's a copy, uh, K-A-P-I-D-O is how it's spelled, New Zealand spider that um, is a neurotoxin, which is what most, if the animal doesn't eat you, then it's, you know, almost always has to kill you with paralysis or um, something like that. Someone else uh, mentioned that they had a, um, a hacker hack into a computer network and uh, turn up an IV, they hacked into the pharmacy system, turned up the IV and um, overdosed somebody on a drug, which I thought was pretty creative too. Sure. That's sort of a, yeah. a uh, 2020 version of um, Agatha Christie, um, just uh, still with the poison, but finding technology ways to, to kill with the poison. <laughs> I like that, that's clever. Yeah. When it comes to committing a murder, I, I would think that the murder weapon would depend a lot on the situation too. I mean, if it's a premeditated murder, you have a lot more options at your disposal, right? Whereas right. if you are killing because you maybe, the, the killer feels threatened because someone is onto them, for example, and they're stuck with just whatever resources they have at their disposal right at that moment, that all factors in too to determining what the weapon will be, right? Yeah, I mean, that sounds right to me. I agree. Yeah. Um, you can have weapons that aren't actual things. I mean, I've had a, a number of stories where someone has been pushed down a flight of stairs or pushed in front of a train or tripped or strangled with your bare hands. There are lots of ways to kill people that you don't need instruments. Yeah, that's kind of Lily Wong's thing, because she is a walking weapon, right? So she's a modern day ninja, and she she's studying, you know, this, I mean, ninja, it's actually a martial art, if you don't, if you all don't know that. But, um, you know, so there are all of these, it's handed down nine different lineages, you know, 1200 years, I mean, there's a lot of information there. But at the core of the philosophy is adapting to what's around you and using whatever is at hand and blending in with things, you know, the ninja are awful, often called the shadow warriors. And so the, the puzzles that the challenges that I come up with, so I'm, I'm now writing the third Lily Wong book, which should probably come out next uh, fall. And so what I, I'm always challenged with are, what are the new things that she can do with her body and that she can pull from her environment? Very good. <clears throat> um, so Tessa, in um, Death in the Family, you had a variety of people die um, during a stormy night and day um, at the manor. Um, and you used a variety of methods for them to die. You probably could have knifed them all to death, but you came up with additional murder um, weapons or murder methods. Why? Well, so... Death in the Family was inspired by Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None, which when I I had written four thrillers before I decided to write a mystery. Um, and then when I did make that decision, I did some research and I reread some of the mysteries that I had recalled really liking, although I always have read in the mystery genre. And one of the books that I reread was Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None. So that was kind of on my mind and it was right around the same time that my kids were getting into the board game Clue which I loved to play so much as a kid. So I 
I, I figured that if I was going to write a mystery and it was somewhat of an experiment too, to just see if I could do it because again, I mean, all I had written so far was thrillers and it had been eight years or something at that point of writing thrillers, but none of them really went anywhere. So what I wanted to do was just incorporate all of the things about traditional classic kind of golden age mysteries that I loved into one new story that had a contemporary kind of fresh twist to it that, you know, took place in, in current times um, in the Thousand Islands of upstate New York. So I kind of melded all of those things together. And so the, the murders that happen in Death in the Family um, and even some of the kind of attempted murders or uh, assaults that happen in the story involve some of the weapons from the game Clue. So it's kind of like I tried to plant these Easter eggs for readers to see because never any, I mean, there is a reference to Clue in the book, so people would pick up on it, I would think, but it's not, you know, mentioned on the back cover, or anything like that, that there, there is a connection in a way to Clue. So I just kind of planted these little Easter eggs to see if people would notice the connection. And, uh, and so, yeah, there is, there is an incident with a rope, for example, and a candlestick. <laughs> so I kind of try to take these very classic, um, somewhat overdone in a sense, mystery tropes and put a fresh twist on them. It's a good way of putting it. And I'm with you. I, that is my favorite Agatha Christie um, book. Um, I, I remember reading it and I'm like, but there are a lot of people who, who could have done this. And, and then she had the twist and I'm like, oh my God, this woman's a great writer. Yeah, um, absolutely. Loved that story. Um, so Barb, you as an editor edit a gazillion short stories and books and, and you're ex and you've written and been awarded many awards for your writing um, beyond the guns, the knives, and the poison. Would you say that guns, knives, and poison is the vast majority of the killing methods in all the books that you both write and edit, or is it fifty-fifty? Or what do you think? If I'm well, if I'm just looking at, at what I've done. Just, just first. So I, I went through all my stories before this and I, I, I did some statistics. So poisoning, 12 times. That includes poisonous food, giving somebody something they're allergic to, mixing medications to a dangerous dose and carbon monoxide poisoning. Then pushing people, I talked about that five times. Hitting somebody with a car or tampering with brakes, five times. Gun, four times. Knife, four times. Hitting someone with a rock or a shovel three times, strangulation with hands or twinkle lights two times, um, having somebody get stuck in a fireplace and down a chimney and then turning up the flame once and then the alligator. <laughs> I love that you took the time to figure out all of this. It's classic. Yep. Yeah. Um, if I'm thinking about uh, stories that things I've re edited for other people. My memory is not what it used to be, so um, that is why I had to actually do the research because otherwise I would not have remembered half of that stuff. I, I think you, you see a lot of people who are, who are, who are, yeah, I think you see a lot of the standards, guns and knives, and because a, a lot of mysteries are, are crimes of convenience, and therefore you're not going to have a lot of these clever things. Hi, baby. Sorry, dog. Oh my gosh, I do not want to spend a dark, stormy night alone with you on an island because <laughs> I'm thinking I won't be leaving alive. You, you're far too creative. Oh, oh I too... said that too. Don't cross Barb. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll say that. Sure, why not? You don't have to know what an introverted I am. I would never go to an island. I'd hardly leave my house. <laughs> so, um, Linda, I assume by the, the title of your um, um, most recent book that you drowned somebody. Um, Drowning with others? Yes. Uh, not so much, but okay. <laughs> well, the car was in the lake, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So um, I don't want to give away the story to um, potential readers, um, 
But I, I guess drowning is a method I haven't considered up to this point. Has anybody on the panel drowned somebody? So you have in that well, book or different one? A different book. And in, in my third Mrs. Frigalicious book, it, it, there was something put in a cocktail and then the guy drowned subsequently as a result of the mixing of alcohol and, and kind of roofies. But um, yeah, there was drowning there. And drowning with others is mo more metaphorical. It's a, it's, it, is a, it is crime fiction. It is a mystery. Um, and it's a, a book that it, it takes place in a boarding school north of Chicago. And it's a back and forth 20 years in the past now. And it, uh, it's the story of a, a woman who a woman. It's a story of a, of a family. It's a, it's sort of a family story. I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, this girl goes to a boarding school that her parents went to. And when she's there in her senior year, a body is discovered in a lake. And it turns out it connects back to her parents from 20 years earlier when they were students at the school. And her journalism class investigates what happens when this body, you know, the, the remains of this uh, person are found in this car. So, um, that isn't the method of death, but but it all connects together. And drowning is a great way, but don't you have to pretty much hold someone down and kill them and, and makes it, it makes it a more difficult way to accomplish that unless you can make it look natural, surfing, you know, that- Or you of. could trap them and then fill whatever you trap them with, you know, with water. That would be unpleasant. I might well, be just get them Lori in the in the house away on the island. <laughs> she has a good gleam about this, you know, hmm, how we can <laughs> yeah. mm, let's think about this. <laughs> Sounds kind of fun. I once wrote a short story where where she had drowned, but again, it wasn't a mystery, it was kind of a, a supernatural literary thing. And uh, yeah, but the whole thing was taking place with her underwater. So that was a wee bit disturbing. So um, we all do research into our killing methods because, you know, we need to get it right for the reader. And plus, it often can become part of the storyline, um, some weird fact about, um, you know, your killing method. So um, uh, for example, uh, for um, Austra my upcoming book in, uh, set in Australia and New Zealand, I used a jellyfish swarm. And um, you, if you have a swarm of them and you get multiple stings in some people, it actually causes cardiac arrest. Um, it's, you know, I think most of us think of jellyfish stings and you throw some vinegar on it and you're fine, but there's a small percentage of people who have will have a heart attack after enough stings. Um, Very cool. <laughs> or you could go Hawaiian style and just pee on it, but you know, that, that's just a thing. I'm just throwing it out there Actually, in case you ever get stung. The peeing thing doesn't work. That was part of my research. Um, there it takes a sting enough. out of it though. It, it, but there's not enough acid. That's yeah. why vinegar is so good at offsetting the sting. So, yeah, the peeing on a, a jellyfish sting is sort of an old wives. <laughs> well, I think it's like, you know, if you're, you know, off in Waimanalo, there's not a whole lot of vinegar at hand. And if it's like stinging, it's like whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I love that you used a whole swarm. Is there a special word for a swarm of jellyfish? Actually, it's called a swarm. Um, oh, that's so boring. I know. <laughs> a lot of like a flight or, a, you know, a, I don't know. So then I had to find a place to buy them. Because like, how do you capture a swarm of jellyfish? You know, so that became part of my research, too. There's a store in Melbourne um, that sells jellyfish, by the way. Oh, someone wrote that it's a smack. A smack. I love it. Um, so. on our, our chat. Um, yeah, so people the, are... Who's the attendee are, from Australia? Um, our friend from Australia um, said that they have a blue-ringed octopus in uh, Melbourne, um, and it, it causes uh, victims to stop breathing. So, um, yeah. Um, so moving on from my, um, my jellyfish smack, um, to uh, Tessa, you know, tell me about the research you did for your Beyond the Game of Clue. 
Yeah, beyond the game of Clue. The major I mean, it's not exciting at all, but the majority of the research I do is just on Google. Um, I definitely try to reach out to subject matter experts whenever I can. So with this book, with Death in the Family, not not specific to actually committing the murder, but to the story itself, I interviewed uh, one of the local sheriffs up in upstate New York to find out about, you know, what it was like to be a senior investigator with the Bureau of Criminal Investigation up there. So, but otherwise, I mean, especially when it comes to murder weapons, I always, this is such a cliched thing to say, but I always tell my kids that, and, and actually it's come to the point now where they tell other people this too, which is problematic, but they, um, you know, the fact that I am always Googling methods of killing people and techniques and, you know, what is the best, one of the thrillers I wrote way back when that hasn't been published um, involved uh, a type of, involved killing someone with a type of anesthetic that vets used. So my search history was all over the place with, you know, how much dosage of this particular medication would be required to kill a human, you know, or actually just put the human, incapacitate the human, put the human to sleep or whatever the case may be. So my search history is very um, suspicious and alarming. And I think that's probably the case for most of us in this <laughs> business, isn't it? <laughs> Let's hope the FBI never tracks us down because I would certainly end up in jail. <laughs> Me too. Linda, yeah. um, tell us about your research. Wingers. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have a bad looking um, research, not anymore, but about six or eight years ago when we were writing that book. Right, and when you when you Google about swingers on the Internet, there's stuff that burns your eyeballs that you can never unsee again. Um, and that's all I'm going to say. Even I suspect if you're if you're into that lifestyle, you'd still see stuff that you're like, yeah, I'm never going to forget that. And oh, boy. And I did kill someone. I did during that book. Um, that was a pretty intense uh, book and, and it was pretty it was an emotional book it wasn't you know it wasn't just about sex and blah 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 but someone does die in there and there was some research where I was looking to see what pills look like um, uh, um, mo you know mo Advil or Motrin like ibuprofen plain ibuprofen and like the brown the brown mm -hmm. pill you know, those little ones are the little orange ones, you know, how they come in different, because I wanted, uh, there was a theme with kids playing with, uh, you know, in playing doctor without sex in a, um, in, in a uh, parent's bathroom and mixing up medicines, which actually ends up, um, what looks like death by sex is turns out to be way more involved than that and way more tragic in some ways. So, um, you do end up looking for some weird, weird stuff on the internet. I've done you know, looked at bulimia and um, anorexia and people dying from diet pills, things like that. And I, I do think it has to look incredibly suspicious on my search history, but whatever. I always figure if they call me in, I'll show them my books and then hopefully we can negotiate how I didn't do the thing, whatever it is. <laughs> Barb, you're the attorney. Are you gonna keep us all out of jail? Oh, I did not do that kind of law, so no. <laughs> Not at all. But if you ever want to buy or sell a college, come see me. <laughs> so tell us about your research. Oh, um, I do almost all my research online. Um, you can really find almost anything online. That, uh, tons of information about, you know, poisons and plants and really anything. I mean, I look at, I watch a lot of videos, you know, try to say, you know, what does the wind sound like in June in, you know, Cape Cod? And you can look it up and you'll find a video and then you can listen to it. Um, sometimes I'll reach out to subject matter experts or I'll call people who I know are, are friends who garden, for example. You know, how, how would this happen or how could this happen? Lucy Zare, the poison lady, is wonderful to reach out to. Um, yeah, that, that's basically it. <laughs> I, yeah. oh, someone made a comment that subject matter experts come up with so much more info than Google. And it's true. Anytime that I don't have a book where I don't have someone that's an expert, um, read it over and make sure it's believable on whatever topic, you know, if they're a horse person or they're this person and we're researching, there's something you're not getting about, about the smell or some little feel of the leather or this or that, or some, no, we wouldn't have this saddle this way, even if you've read that 20 times. So I always have somebody that knows what they're talking about, look it over, because there's nothing worse than getting um, 
a message from a reader that's like, you do not know this, this thing, you know, this poison or this subject matter or this, you know, I couldn't write about ninjas without talking to Tori first. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So I'm kind of in a unique situation where I am a subject matter expert. <laughs> now, granted, I do a heck of a lot of research for all the books that I write, even if they're not in the Lily Wong series. And with the exception of the Ninja Daughter, every novel I've, I've written um, has begun with research. And so what I spent a lot of my time researching are the themes of the books, like The Ninja's Blade does a deep dive into the commercial sex trafficking of youth in Los Angeles. So uh, that's what I'm looking at, right? So I'm, I'm researching a lot about that. But that said, you know, Lily draws extensively from my background, right? So I'm Chinese, Hawaiian and Norwegian. She's Chinese and Norwegian. I've lived in Los Angeles for over 35 years. She's from, you know, based in Los Angeles. We have the martial arts experience. Um, in my background, I started in Tong Sudo and went into kickboxing and ground fighting and eskrima sticks before I got into the ninja arts, which is, you know, wildly all encompassing. And then my favorite um, uh, weapons were the long weapons, spears, bows, uh, things of that nature. And my son was on the UCLA Wushu team, <laughs> which is why I made Lily Wong on back in her history on the LA Wushu team. It's a little nod to UCLA. There you go. But uh, his uh, Sifu was very gracious at that he um, afforded me the professional courtesy of teaching me some Wushu spear and bow. So I was able to incorporate that in, in there too. So um, that said, you know, Lily isn't me, and I still did research um, on all sorts of things from heritage to the, you know, our cultural heritage to our city, but even in the martial arts. So uh, authenticity is like the biggest thing in this series, right? I mean, it's an own voices mystery thriller. It's got to be authentic. And I'm really pushing to show um, a modern I'm trying to break through, you know, the whole sensationalized ninja thing, right? And show kind of, no, you know, this, this is actually a thing and this could be like this. So everything that she does are things that I have either taught or executed or witnessed or researched. And so when I'm going to research things, you know, of course I will go into Google because I have forgotten more than most practitioners will ever learn. And I have to go look up stuff or I have to go in and look up, you know, I have folders and folders of all these notes and things. But then I also have a friend who is a subject matter export for the Marine Corps martial arts program. And he is, in addition to being a Marine, he's a 10th degree, uh, ninja and has been at this way longer than me. And he happens to also do the consultation for Joseph Finder, which I find just tremendously amusing. And so that's like super fun. His name is Jack Hoban. So he was my beta reader. Um, so, you know, I wrote all this and it's like, okay, I had my beta readers. I had a, you know, first generation Chinese American friend. I had Jack Hoban. I had, you know, so I, ch I chose all these beta readers to double check these things that I am supposed to know, right? Just to make sure, because as, um, you know, as Linda says, you get one thing wrong and boy, they will, you know, but fortunately, when it comes to, to fighting and killing and rescuing, because Lily is a rescue protector, um, I've got a lot of friends on speed dial. Great. Um, we have a question from the audience as to whether any of us regret um, a certain killing method that we used in a book. Um, my, uh, I'll start my first book um, that I wrote, Vials. Um, I actually used, um, again, I looked for the FBI outside my door. I used rocket um, RPGs, rocket propelled grenades or whatever. And I, I was looking at all these shoulder things, you know, guns. And um, it. I regret the overkill of that. And... I, I think that was the last book that I had a gun murder in. And I stay away from guns because uh, I know nothing about them and nothing upsets mm. readers more than for you to put, um, you know, to say that I have a, 
something with a safety on it and it doesn't have a safety or an, I can't even keep straight, you know, um, the, the different things that carry bullets. Um, clips and magazines. Yeah, clips and magazines. I, I can't even keep that straight. So I, um, I re- pretty much regret any time I've used a gun in a story because I know that it's a weak um, weapon on my part. So Tessa, any regrets? I wouldn't say that I have any regrets, but I definitely agree that it makes sense for the majority of authors to use weapons that they understand or maybe have some personal experience with. That's obviously the case with Tori too. Um, it, so I take martial arts also, but to a much lesser degree, I only started, I do Shaolin Kempo Karate, but I only started three years ago. So, you know, I'm slowly working my way up. I'm only a blue belt, but that does factor into my second book, The Dead Season, um, not with a murder per se, but with uh, self-defense, several self-defense scenes where the main character uses martial arts and that in that particular style of karate because um because I thought if I'm going to incorporate that it better be something that I understand personally um partially to make sure that it is well executed on the page but also because maybe I guess I thought that I might have a, a unique perspective on things um having had personal experience in it so I also went to my two senseis that I take class with um, to make sure that everything was as authentic and accurate as possible. Um, but no, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I necessarily regret any, any murder weapons or methods of murder that I've used so far. Um, we'll see what happens. And <laughs> I just finished writing a thriller, a standalone thriller that's um, kind of soon to be out on submission, I hope. And in that one, the murder method, one of the murder methods is scissors. Um, and I won't say any more about how those were used, but um, definitely in an interesting way. And I hope I don't come to regret it because they were used in a very unique way, I think. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, it's probably going to be quite some time before that book is out in the world. But uh, yeah, let's let's hope it all worked out. Um, before I move on to Linda, uh, I read our uh, host has been um, counting down and we're below 10 minutes. So if the audience has any more questions, well, um, we're answering this question about murder weapons that we regret. This is your sort of your final opportunity to ask um, the panel questions. So Linda, any regrets? Yeah, I have one regret and it's not a murder weapon, but it was an attempted murder weapon. And here's, ah. I don't, my my confession is I don't like killing people in books at all, and I want other things to happen that are more, um, sometimes uh, emotional strangulation is way more effective than real strangulation. But in my book, The Big Bang, my character, um, one of the characters dipped her husband's toothbrush in the toilet because she hated him so much that she wanted him to get hepatitis and die. Um, and so, and he didn't, um, but the reason I'm sorry about that particular method is that it is one of the few things that I based on something that happened. And I had an aunt, I have an uncle that's been married a number of times and they were very poorly married to each other. And um, at some point there was a rumor I heard from my mother when I was young that she had dipped his toothbrush in the toilet because she hated him so much and she wanted him to die. And that stuck with me for years and years. And I kind of, in retrospect, I love her and I can see where that marriage had gotten so toxic that, that you could be looking for outs um, or at least emotional outs. And so then when the book was published, I had a book signing in my hometown and um, lo and behold, she turns up at my book signing, this, this ex aunt of mine who I love dearly now. And I didn't not love her then. And she said, I've read your book. I've already read, I've already started reading it. And I was like, Oh, gra- Oh, <laughs> and I had this horrible, I'm like, well, what page are you on? And she's like, Oh, I'm on page, yeah, I'm about page 60. And I was like, Oh no. And I know that she's read. I know that she read it. She knew. I mean, it was just a horrible moment. And if I, I mean, I haven't ever mentioned it to her again, cause we're now Facebook friends and whatever, but I'd love to laugh with her about it. But I do regret putting that in there and not having ever said to her, I'm, you know what? I get where you were coming from. Not that I would do it, but gosh, 
you know, things had gotten so toxic. It was like a Diana and, uh, and Prince Charles situation in that marriage at that point. And at around the same time. So I, you know, I had a lot of sympathy for her, but I felt bad about putting that in there, but loving that I put in that, put it in the book. So yeah, yeah attempted murder. Um, so we have a question of, have we used an animal to kill someone other than an alligator? Um, that Barb mentioned early. And um, all, of, all of my attempted murders in my upcoming book were all, uh, they were attempted murders, not successful murders. The snake, the spider, the jellyfish, um, the gray sea slug. Um, but anybody else used an animal to kill? No, I didn't think so. I feel like I've read a book where bees were used because the killer was aware of an allergy. Right. I want to say I've read one like that. Um, and then we have another question. Uh, well, the, the killing of the victim is our topic. Has anyone killed their perp? Um, well, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what Lily's all about. So I don't write, uh, I, I haven't written, maybe I will at some point, I have not written a, a classic murder mystery, right? That starts with somebody's dead and now you got to find who done it. That's kind of not what's going on. Lily is a rescue protector of women and children. So she's going in and extracting people from these, situ these women and children from these situations. And then it it inevitably pulls her into some, you know, deep complex mystery that she has to solve. Now on that way, there are dangerous people that usually end up getting in the way. Lily has never killed anybody. She's never murdered anybody. Or she's never assassinated anybody. She has killed a few people. Uh, I'd like to say that they are all in self-defense or in the protection of other people. So that would be my answer to that one. Um, so we also have a question about, uh, have any of us killed the wrong person? You have. Um, the, the diet pill poisoning was the, the intended victim was different. Um, but I set it up that no one was very sorry that the person who did die, died. So <laughs> it, it ended up being a win-win. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I can't say more without giving away. It's in Eternally 21, my first um, Mrs. Frugalicious book. But there was, um, the intended victim was not the person who who ends up. And and it was kind of fun. It made the mystery much more um, complex and, and the reasons for it. So yeah, that was kind of fun. I shouldn't say that, should I? Fun is murder. <laughs> I guess. Sure, why not? In fiction, of course. On a panel like this, anything goes. Yes. And uh, so we're below five minutes and one final question. Have you ever killed a character you really loved, but you just had to have them killed? And um, I, since I write series, I have repetitive characters and I killed a, a minor character who became um, part of the, the story, but I've never killed any of my major um, characters out, despite what Stephen King says about kill your darlings. So um, anybody else want to talk about killing somebody, a character in one of your stories that you really loved? Um, I'll mention that in, in my story, Alex's Choice, which was up for the McCavity Award and did not win yesterday, but that's all right. Um, I, I, neither did I. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is going to be a spoiler. Sorry for anybody who hasn't read the story yet. I almost kill a dog, and that I love dogs. <laughs> like, like, don't kill the dog or the cat. <laughs> for the story to work, what one, one character has to sacrifice and try to kill a dog to save someone else, and then the dog lives in the end. But I was I hated writing it, um, and I really worried that people would never they'd stop where they think the dog dies and they would never get to the end and find out that the dog lives. But it was also very cathartic to me because I wrote that story a month after my first dog died. And it really helped me um, work things out on the pitch. Wow. 
Anybody else? Uh, I try and kill who needs to be killed. You know, I and, and that's the only way I can I can put that. And sometimes it's not a, a pleasant thing, but it it's it, yeah. I, I have not killed the, the the. I was looking at someone who said about the perp, and I, and I did kill try to kill a a perp. I had a character slash some tires that almost killed the perp, but it was all, it was more of a, the reasoning was, was convoluted there. But um, the characters that you love, it's sometimes they can die, but it's hard to kill them, I would say. It's particularly hard to kill them and not animals. You never, you never kill animals in fiction, although it can happen, they can die, but you don't kill them. So I'm gonna wrap up the panel. Um, it's four o'clock and um, I think Barb and Tori still are up for awards at five o'clock. So yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> um, you know, best wishes and good luck. And um, thank, thank you to all the attendees for listening and um, my fellow panelists for making this an enjoyable hour. Thank you to you for- Thank for you. Everyone. Thanks so much. This has been great fun.